worship you. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us. The mercy displayed on the cross, the graciousness of which you came to die for us. Lord, we just want to honor you. Lift your name on high. Glorify you. Thank you for the day.
bring joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me. Now the king of Syria was making war with the war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God, who you'll see in a moment is Elisha, sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him, and, and thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and he said to them, Will you not show me which of, you, uh, which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go, see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mount was full of horses and chariots and fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and there they were inside Samaria. 
When the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And he answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them, and after they ate and drank, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. Killed them with kindness, didn't they? Stand with me, let's pray now. Lord, as I've prayed all week, as i prayed this morning, open our eyes today. Open the eyes of each person that's come here today, expecting to hear a word from you. Wherever they are in their spiritual journey, or if they haven't begun the journey yet, or if they're downcast, or they're brokenhearted, or if they're confused, they need direction. They need conviction. Lord, whatever the need is, open our eyes. We bring you tithes and offerings because you are the God who opens eyes. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the God of Elisha, and you're our God. So we acknowledge that by bringing you tithes and offerings. We bring you song. We bring you our praise. Lord, we bring you this hour. We come to meet with you now. Lord, open our eyes and change us, we pray. In Christ's precious name we ask. Amen. You can be seated. They say sometimes you win some.
to stand to your feet. Um, one thing that I've noticed um, being in ministry, and I noticed it before when I was doing ministry from not a full-time position, but it's even worse now. And I say worse, not in a bad way, but most of the time when we gather in meetings, we gather in small groups, and we have Bible studies or whatever, and we kind of go around, how you doing, how you doing, and the usual fine. And I find that the, generally the theme that runs through that time in, in, in a study is that I, everything's pretty good, but i got a few little hiccups that are going on. And the more that I'm in ministry, the more I find out that it's actually 180 degrees opposite of that, that usually life is pretty disastrous. And there's a few things that are going right, and most of those are Jesus. Um, and I just... I think that there's something that we're missing. I know there's something that I'm missing, and it's a conversation Claire and I have continuously, and that is I'd just rather not. I feel like if I open that up, it's going to get real ugly. If I start telling what's really going on, um, but there's something to be said for the mercy and the graciousness of our Father when we're just honest enough to say that I really am messed up. I mean, really messed up, because I would rather not. I'd rather be clean and polished and that would be an easier, well, I say that. It seems to me in my fallen state that that would be the easier posture to hold. But it, one, I can't hold it. And two, it's not a good posture to have. Um, that I really am messed up. I mean, I, you know, I've grown up kind of trying to keep the law. That's kind of my MO. I'm just going to, okay, God's word says that. I'm going to be obedient to that. Forget the Holy Spirit. Don't bring him into it. I'm just going to be obedient. And there's just no life in that. There's no life in trying to be obedient to the scriptures only for the sake of being obedient so that you can check it off a list. Um, if there's no spirit power and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you can't keep that up and you were never meant to keep that up. And so I wonder if we could in this time of worship just honor the Lord. And in my mind, and I need to have a submissive attitude that stays surrendered under the authority of Him, recognizing that the only thing that has access to Him is His graciousness towards me. It certainly has nothing to do with anything that I could bring to Him. And so as we sing and honor Him, having that posture in our heart that says, surrender, this is really about you. This is not about anybody up on this stage performing any songs. There's no, the sound, the lighting, all that stuff. Just forget all of that. And the posture of our hearts towards the Lord of being a surrendered servant to Him, recognizing that the only access we have to Him has, see, I can say this, it's just a matter of it registers. Because I know in, in my mind, I hear somebody say the words that are coming out of my mouth, and I hear, yeah, but, yeah, but I still have to hold on to something. He's the one holding on to us. Anything that's good is Him. And so anything that's bad, He's forgiven. So quit, quit it, quit. Let's sing to Him.
good question. Do you remember the first time that God opened your eyes? And you saw something that you've never seen before. If you're a true Christian, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <coughs> The moment that God opened your eyes and showed you that you were a sinner. And I don't mean the good old boy definition of sinner. You know, you can ask everybody around here, are you a sinner? Say, yeah, everybody is. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when God opened your eyes and went, oh my. I've sinned against the holy God. And I'm guilty. And I need a savior. Only God can do that. I remember the first time God opened my eyes. I, I, I will never forget it. I was only seven years old. Uh, but it changed me. And I've never gotten over it. I saw that I was a sinner, even as a seven-year-old. I knew I needed something. And I didn't know what to do with it in my thank goodness for a godly mother who knew exactly what was happening to me and she told me that I needed a savior and she pointed me to Christ and uh, I asked the Lord to save me and he did what I experienced was revelation from God as Henry Blackaby put it several years ago I experienced God for the first time So it was for this young man in this story, the servant of a very powerful prophet by the name of Elisha. And the scripture says in 2 Kings 6 verse 17 on your outline or on the screen, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. Not his physical eyes. Because all his physical eye saw was trouble. He saw with the eye of faith. That is only something God can do. That is a miracle from God. Let me tell you something. This, the, the book of Kings is a, it covers a period of about 400 years. As you read through, and it was the kings of Israel. And as you read through this time, there were four nations that gave Israel fits during this time. And... Two of them conquered Israel, Assyria and Babylon. The other two were Egypt and Syria. The one we're talking about here today is Syria. God raised them up because God's people were disobedient and had gone deeply into sin and idolatry. And God raised up these heathen nations to discipline them and then ultimately to bring them into bondage so that they would learn the lessons that God wanted them to learn. This is the Syrian nation, and they're tormenting Israel. And it's a time of, of rampant sin in Israel, but most of all, it was a time of rank idolatry. The Israelites were into Baal worship. Their king at this time was Joram. You won't see it, but you would see it later on if you went into chapter 8. And he's... He's a wicked man and he had, he's the son of wicked parents. He was the son of Ahab and Jezebel. And he carried on their legacy of Baal worship. So God raises up the Syrians and you hear that story of the Syrians were coming and they planned another raid on Israel. And every time they'd make plans for a raid, God would tell Elisha what they were going to do. And so God, Elisha would tell Joram, and he'd get ready for it. And the king of Syria got frustrated. He said, there's a mole among my, among my folks, and who's telling the secrets to Israel? And one of his servants said, Master, there's a man in Israel named Elisha who tells what's even going on in your bedroom. How does that thought strike you? That God sees into your bedroom. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, Scripture says. 
And God is telling Elisha their military plans, and Elisha tells Joram, and they get ready, and they and they got ready for this raid. You see, let me tell you what God's doing. One of the things he's doing is, the main thing he's doing is, is listen, I want the people of Israel to know that I'm God, not some wooden idol. I want Joram to know that I'm God. I'm the God of Elisha. I'm the God of Israel. And I tell Elisha things that no wooden idol can tell that wicked king, that Syria king. I know all things. I am the one true God. And God is demonstrating His power once again to the nation of Israel through a prophet named Elisha. Well, he went to take Elisha captive and sent a large company of men to do that. They surround Elisha and his servant gets up and sees all these this enemy surrounding him and he's scared out of his mind. And God gives Elisha the power and he prays and says, Lord, open his eyes that he can see that greater is us, those that are with us than with them. And God opens the heavens and shows him the chariots and the armies of heaven. And he sees something he's never seen before. And then God prompts Elisha and Elisha says, Lord, would you blind these enemies? And he blinds them and takes them to Samaria and opens their eyes. And Joram wants to kill them all. And he says, you're not going to kill them. You didn't capture them. Feed them. And you see a beautiful illustration of the New Testament promise or the New Testament principle of overcome the evil with good. And they feed their enemies and they send them on their way. It's a miraculous story, but there's something here I want you to see. There's something here that God opened my eyes to this week that I needed to share with you so that he could open your eyes. Take your outline. And this message is about spiritual vision. And number one, spiritual vision is the remedy for the disturbed in heart. Brian mentioned earlier, and he did in the first service, that we tend to come to church and we shake each other's hands and say, how you doing? I'm, I'm doing fine, and most of us are liars. Because we're not doing fine. We've had a tough week. Now, some of that may be true, that we've had a great week and everything is great. But for most folks coming to church on Sunday morning, they've had a tough week. They're disturbed about something. They may be disturbed about their sin. They may be disturbed about an addiction. They may be disturbed about a big decision that's coming up. They may be disturbed about a wayward child. They may be disturbed about their job. They may be disturbed about their finances. Whatever it is, we come disturbed. And I'll tell you, this servant was disturbed. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Even though this young man was serving a powerful prophet, he didn't know the God of Elisha like Elisha knew. More than likely, he didn't have a personal, what we would call a personal relationship with the God of Elisha. And the Bible makes it clear in the New Testament why a sinner doesn't have a relationship with God. The natural man only sees the physical. Paul said, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. He's got a second problem. His sight's been darkened. Sin has darkened his sight, Paul says in Romans 1. Because although they knew God, he's speaking of sinners in general, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were what? Darkened. And it gets worse. 
we have an enemy called Satan, and he blinds people. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, but even if our gospel is veiled or we can't see it, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. But for this young servant, that was about to change. God was about to do what? And he's about to open his eyes. And listen, what he would see would cure his disturbed heart. What are you disturbed about today? If God would open your eyes and see, let you see what he sees. I want to tell you something. It would calm your fears. It would calm your disturbance. Because it did for this young man. You see spiritual vision. Number two, write this down. It sees the invisible. It sees, the, it sees what the physical eye can't see. It sees the invisible. So he answered, do not fear Elisha to the servant. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. It's the ability to see what God sees. The servant, all he could see was the enemy. Trouble. <coughs> danger. Elisha saw something completely different. He saw the invisible. He saw the armies of heaven. And he saw them with the eye of faith that God had given him. He realized and he knew, this young servant didn't, but Elisha knew this battle's the Lord's. This isn't my battle. It's not the service. This is the Lord's battle. Elisha knew he wasn't sufficient to deal with this, but he knew his God was. But he also knew this servant didn't understand that. Have you not, has it not been amazing to you that two people can look at a situation and you both see the same thing, but you see it from two different perspectives? And you wonder, did we see the same thing? As a spiritual leader, as a pastor, as a disciple, I marvel. You know, you can take a babe in Christ. And they can see something, and you can take somebody who's been a Christian a while, and they've grown, and they're a father or a mother in the faith, and they look at two things, and they see something totally different. And that spiritual growth changes your whole perspective. You've seen God, you've seen God do things, and you've seen things from God's point of view, and you just see it totally different. And the young babe in Christ is rattled out of their mind, and the, the mature one is... They know God's got this. God's got this. It's going to be okay. Well, the servant wasn't there yet, but he was about to be. What a difference seeing the invisible makes. What a difference seeing the invisible makes. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Notice. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things what? Not seen. I like what Chuck Swindoll says about vision. Vision is looking at life through the lens of God's eye. That's what Elisha was doing. That's what the servant was about to learn. Spiritual vision number three. Listen. Listen can only be given by the one true God. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray you open his eyes that he may see. You're the only one that can do this. I can't do it, but you can. And as I said before, I want to say again, this is so important because 
This was a time in Israel where they were worshiping idols. And this king that he was serving was worshiping Baal. And he was encouraging other people to do that. And Baal can't see anything. And God's using Elisha to open not only this servant's eyes, but to open this king's eyes. And his eyes weren't opened. But the servant's was. See, the armies of heaven... I can tell you the secrets of another man. I can do all things. And Elisha blinds his whole troop and brings them to this king. And he wants to kill him. And he said, you're not killing him. You didn't capture him. Feed him. Let me ask you something. If you're Joe Ram and you see this, what are you thinking? Wouldn't that make you want to go, you know what? Maybe I don't need to be worse than this idol. Maybe I need to listen to Elisha and his God. But oh my goodness, doesn't people's blindness amaze you sometimes? You know what amazes me? My own blindness. So many times God has opened my eyes to things and then I just start thinking, Lord, what else do I not see? In my marriage, Lord, what else do I not see when God has opened my eyes to something I needed to see? With my children, raising children, and God has opened my eyes to something. And then I think, Lord, what else do I not see? Oh, we need spiritual vision. Look what Charles Spurgeon said. Y'all, this is so powerful. While the preacher imagines that he can do something, He will do nothing. While teachers or parents entertain the belief that there is some innate power in themselves with which they can do God's work, they are off the right track. For God will not work through those who believe in their own self-sufficiency. But when you say, I can no more save a soul than I can open the eyes of a man born blind, I am utterly helpless in this matter, then it is that you begin to what? And beginning to pray, you are taught how to act. And God uses you as His instrument. And eyes are opened, opened by you instrumentally, and God gets all the glory. You know what one of the biggest battles that Christians deal with in the flesh is? Self-sufficiency. Uh -huh. Do you know that Wills Valley is battling self-sufficiency? You know how I know? Because we have about 20 people that come here to pray on Sunday night. And there ought to be a lot more. Now, if you're in a small group, and y'all are meeting on Sunday nights and praying, I'm not talking to you. If you're opening your Bible from 6 to 7 o'clock, and you're spending time with the Lord on the Lord's Day, I'm not talking to you. If you're watching TV, if you're bowing down at the altar of the NFL, if you're watching your story, and you're not gathering with the saints to pray, you know what that tells me? You're self-sufficient. And you know what God uses to deal with self-sufficiency? Trouble. How many times, how many times have we all said something happens and it drives us to our knees and we run to the Lord for comfort? And we say, why did it take this to get me to a spiritually alive again? 
Why did it take this? Why did it take this for me to seek the Lord again? Because we're self-sufficient. It's one of the biggest battles you'll fight as a believer, as a disciple. Lord, I got this. I'll holler at you when I'm in trouble. And then we live it out. You got loved ones that need to be saved. Do you have children that are straying? You concerned about your work? You concerned about your marriage? Are you facing trials that you don't know what to do with? Let me tell you, God uses trials to destroy self-sufficiency in us. And it's not that he's mad at us, and it's not that he's, he's he loves us. He's, he's trying to conform us to the image of Christ, but you know what? You can't be conformed to the image of Christ when you're self-sufficient. And you can't, sure can't lead your children to Christ. And you sure can't go to work and lead your, 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 work, your fellow worker to Christ. And you sure can't do anything that's worthwhile for eternity in your own power. Jesus told his disciples, could you not watch with me one hour? Yes, this is a call to corporate prayer. Yes, unless you're sick or you're out of town or you're in a small group, whatever. I love you enough to say, I think you need to be here on Sunday evening from 6 to 7. And unless you're driving long distances and it's very difficult, you need to be here praying. You know why? To acknowledge to God that you're not self-sufficient to make it through the week or the day. Or that you've got loved ones that you're very concerned about. Or that you need to grow. Or that whatever it is the disturbing situation is that you need God to open your eyes to. To see. Y'all, we need Him. We need Him. We're not self sufficient. I look back at these young people back there. What are they going to do with their life? What does God want them to do with their life? They need to see what God sees. What do you tell your children? What are you going to do with your life? They need vision. They need spiritual vision. They need God to open their eyes about where, why He's put them on this earth. Yes, it's to glorify God, but Lord, specifically, how do you want me to do that? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? They need vision. We need vision for everything we do. We need to see it from God's point of view. Spiritual vision, listen is the will of God, write this down, and He will answer this prayer. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man because Elisha had prayed, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, strike this people. I pray with blindness, and he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. God was hearing his prayers. Because Elisha wasn't sufficient enough to deal with this situation. And neither was the servant. God heard his prayer. God gave vision. You say, well, Pastor Vinny, I'm not a prophet. I'm not Elisha. I'm not either. But what does the psalmist say in Psalm 65? Oh, you who hear what? Can you pray? Are you burdened to pray? 
Has life brought enough pressure into your life that you feel the need to pray? Have you fouled up big enough in some area of your life to say, you know what, I need to pray. Are the finances going haywire to where you say, I need to pray. Me and my wife aren't getting along. I need to pray. What do you think God is doing with these challenges and these struggles? Oh, you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Can I ask you? I don't want you to answer out loud. I want you to answer between you and the Lord in your heart. Are you praying? May I be so bold as to say, if you're not, it's because you're self-sufficient. You think you've got this. And I'll just go ahead and tell you, you don't. You and I tend to think we're in control of life, and I'll tell you something, you're not. And events are coming your way that will remind you once again that you're not in control of anything. You're not even in control of the breath that you breathe. That's a gift from God. Amen. He can remove it at any moment, any time. Well, so what? We could apply this in so many ways. Well, I've got three or four things I want to share with you and then we'll close. Number one. We all lack spiritual vision until we're born from above. Jesus answered and said to him to Nicodemus, you remember? Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot what? See the kingdom of God. You can't see what God sees unless you're born again. Or literally what the Greek word means is born from above. God's got to do something in your heart to cause you to begin to see now we're back to the sovereignty of God and what we talked about last week. You and I have to be born from above. We have to be given the ability to see. God has to open our eyes. We call that saving faith. We call that the gift of faith. We call that the grace of faith because faith allows you to see the invisible, to see the unseen. We preach the gospel. You hear the gospel. That God became human flesh. He took on flesh and blood. He was born as a baby in Bethlehem. And we're going to be celebrating Christmas again here real soon. He took on flesh and blood. He grew up and lived a perfect life that you and I could never live. And He died on a Roman cross to pay a sin debt that you and I could never pay. And He rose again three days later to prove He was who He said He was. And He tells us, I have the power to forgive your sins. I have the power to open your eyes. I have the power to change your life. And we hear that message and God gives us the grace of faith and we receive it. We see it, we receive it, and all of a sudden our eyes are open. That's where it begins. Let me ask you something. Have you been born again? Have you ever been born from above? It could be today. I know our crowd was a lot bigger in the first service than here today. But there's a lot of folks here. There may be somebody here. Because I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you all week. I've prayed for you this morning. I've prayed for you Saturday morning. I pray that God would open eyes in both services in a powerful way. And maybe He's opening your eyes today. And you go, you all of a sudden, like this servant for the first time, you realize, you know what? I've never been born again. I'm not even sure I know what that means. And I'm going to invite you in just a moment when we pray. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're not sure you've ever experienced it, but you want to, I want to tell you something. That's God's open. That's God opening your eyes. <coughs> Ask Him to save you. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to come into your life and be your Lord and Master. And he will today. Number two, you say, Pastor Denny, I'm, I am born again, and I know most of you are here. But I'm facing a desperate situation right now. Do you have something for me? Absolutely. 
I've got a story here from Genesis 21. Do you remember the story about Abraham and Sarah? God had promised them a son, but he, he delayed and it took a while. And Sarah got frustrated and said, uh, I'm going to give my handmaiden, my servant girl, to you, Abraham, and you're going to have a son by him. Her name was Hagar. And she did give Hagar to him, and he, she conceived, and she bore a son named Ishmael. And when that son was born, and then Isaac came not too long after that, and of course, now you've got a dysfunctional family because two females don't like one another, Sarah and Hagar, and there's jealousy, and Ishmael starts giving Isaac a hard time, and Sarah goes and starts nagging on Abraham. Get rid of her. And get rid of that boy. And God told Abraham, it's okay to do that. And he gave her food and water and sent them on their way. Because God was going to take care of them too. Look on verse 16. And he sent them on their way to the desert of Beersheba. And she, this is Hagar. She went and sat down across from her boy, Ishmael, from him at a distance of about a bow shot, for she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. They'd run out of food, they'd run out of water, and they were thirsty to death. So she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice, and she wept, and God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? Let me stop right there. Will's Valley, listen to me. What ails you today? What ails you today? This is as relevant to you as it was to her. What ails you today? This is the word of God. This is God speaking. Fear not. For God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand. For I will make him a great nation. And he does. And you see it played out on the news every day now in the Middle East with Isaac and Ishmael going at it. And he did make them a great nation. But he wasn't the child of promise. Verse 19, then God opened her what? And she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. And they were saved. Can I ask you something? Why didn't she see that well? I believe it was there all along. She just didn't see it. I don't think God just, he could, just created a well and stuck it in the water. I'm in the ground right there. But at that moment, he could have done that. I don't think that's what it, I don't think that's what it was. He opened her eyes. Her eyes need to be opened. What she desperately needed was water was right there all the time. She just didn't see it. What are you desperate over today? God's well is right near you and you don't see it. What's your soul thirsty for? What's your soul longing for? What are you thirsting for? What are you disturbed over? I want to tell you something. God's provision is probably right next door to you, and you don't see it. And you need your eyes open. What do, my, what do me and my wife need to do to stop this fussing? What kind of career does God want me to pursue? What am I going to do about this debt and all these bad financial decisions we've made and now I'm, now I'm, in, a, I'm in big trouble? What am I going to do? I think I'm about to lose my job. What am I going to do? 
I'm not growing spiritual like I ought to be. I know I'm not. What do I need to do? What's your well? What well do you need to drink from? I'll tell you something. When God opens your eyes, you'll see it. Psalm 34, verse 17 says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord, what? And he delivers them out of all their troubles. What's crying out? His prayer. His prayer. We need to grow spiritually. We need to grow in vision, and we can grow in vision. Once God opens your eyes and you're his child, he wants you to grow in the ability to see what he wants you to see. You say, well, I thought God is the only one that could cause us to see things. He is. But we cooperate with him, and he's given us certain things that if we do it, if we pursue them, he said, I'll open your vision. I'll give you vision to see. But he also warns us in Scripture that there are things that will shut down your vision. And here's a couple of them. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. What will hinder that? Well, sin will hinder your growth and vision. Let me tell you something. When you get involved in sin, it'll blind you. If there's something going on in your life and God's prompted you to deal with it and repent of it and not only ask His forgiveness but repent, turn away from it, and you don't and it becomes a habit, then an addiction or whatever, guess what? It'll blind you. God's people can get blinded. How do you know? Matthew 5 8. What does Matthew 5 8 say? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? They'll see God. If your heart's not pure, that doesn't mean perfect. And yes, that begins with salvation, but let me tell you something. It's a challenge to keep a pure heart every day as a Christian, is it not? Is that not true? Guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Let me ask you something. Is your heart impure today? That'll, it'll, it'll affect your ability to see what God wants you to see. There's a second one. Blind spots, what Scripture calls planks in the eye. What does that mean? The Bible says don't judge others because you yourself will be judged. Jesus goes on to say, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the plank in your own eye? Matthew 7 and 5 says, you hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. In all my years of marriage counseling, I have never, not once, had a person come in and say, we are having marital problems and I'm the problem. Pastor, will you help me deal with my blind spots and my planks? No. They come in and the women say, my husband's the problem. And the husbands go, my wife is the problem. You need to straighten her out. Planks. Planks. And Jesus said, you're not going to see clearly until you get the planks out of your own eye and you judge yourself first. Y'all, I want you to know I'm the plank expert because I've had a lot of them. I can't tell you through the years how many times God has had to point out blind spots to me. And you know what? I remember, and I'm going to go into detail about this, but several years ago, a dear Christian confronted me about and said, you're a prideful person. I've been their pastor. Um, and they said, you're a prideful person. I said, can you give me some examples of what are you talking about? They said, nope. They said, you have an air of pride about you. 
thanks, but um, I didn't see it. And I went on a mission trip. And on that mission trip, God opened my eyes in such a shocking way. I saw other Christians on this mission trip from other ministries acting pridefully in another country. And it angered me. And I was asked to speak, and I lowered the boom on them. And after I got through lowering the boom on them, God spoke into my mind and my heart and said, what you just saw is you. And I sat down and it was so shocking. I can't tell you how shocking it was. God opened my eyes to my own pride. I came home. I went to the house of that person. And I sat down with him and I said, and I told him what happened. And I said, thank you for confronting me. Thank you for telling me what you told me. I couldn't see it, but I see it now. I was a pastor. I was a young pastor. You see, this young pastor needed sight. I didn't see what they saw, and I said, thank you. Thank you. And that person sat there with tears streaming down their face. And they said, God's going to use you in a mighty way. Their whole attitude changed. That's happened more than once because I do have a pride issue. Now listen, I want y'all to come to me. Be nice. <clears throat> but I don't want blind spots in my life to hinder me from being a blessing to you and glorifying God and watching you grow. And I'm not above Christians pointing out my blind spots. I need them. I've got them. Planks. Planks in my I just don't see. Guess what? You've got planks too. And I wonder. Are you in conflict with somebody right now? Let me give you some spiritual dynamite that you probably hadn't thought about because it requires you to humble yourself. It may turn the whole situation around immediately. Get your eyes off what they're doing wrong and go to them and say, God has opened my eyes to something that's convicting me. Would you show me what I'm doing wrong? Would you show me how I've mistreated you? Would you show me if there's a need in your life I haven't been meeting? Would you show me? They'll get up off the floor. More than likely. They may not. But I'll tell you something. When you humble yourself, you bring the power of God into a situation. And if you are interested in taking planks out of your eye, I will tell you something. God says, then you will see clearly how to take the specks out of other people's eyes. That makes sense? Are you amazed at how, and I am, how God uses afflictions? Look at the third bullet. To prepare us for growth and vision. You've heard me say many times that the most important lessons you learn in life are usually through suffering. Job 42 verse 5, after he'd gone through all the suffering that he went through, and God shows up and asks him 62 questions. Where were you? <coughs> Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? All those questions are designed to impress upon Job that God is omniscient, that he knows what he's doing, and he was doing something in Job's life that Job couldn't see and understand. And 
he needed to trust God. And when God was through asking his questions, Job said in Job 42, 5, I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. What are you what are you desperate about today? Let me exhort you to do something. Stop saying, God, get me out of this. And start saying, Lord, open my eyes to see what it is that you want me to learn. And you know what? He'll do one of two things. First of all, he'll answer that prayer. He'll show you if you really want to know. And he'll either deliver you out of that situation or he'll deliver you through it and you'll see it from a whole new perspective and there'll be victory. It's amazing how God, it's amazing how afflictions stop us in our tracks and they make us open to seeing things that only God can show. Um, God answers the prayer for growth and vision. Psalm 119, verse 18. David said, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your law. Y'all, I pray that every time I pick this book up. And you know what? God shows me things all the time. Well, you're a pastor. Not because I'm a pastor. When I open this book and I say, Lord, open my eyes. Then I'm in the whole wonderful things from your law. You know what? God gives me vision all the time. I see the invisible. I see things in my life. I see things in your life. I'm praying this constantly about, Lord, what do you want me to preach next Sunday? Open my eyes to a word in due season. What do your people need to hear? And so many of you tell, as you leave here, say, I, Pastor Dean, that's exactly what I needed to hear today. You know why? That's vision. That ain't me. That's God giving me that. Did you know that we have the privilege of every time we open this Bible, if we'll say, Lord, open my eyes, I may behold wonderful things from your law, God will answer that prayer. <clears throat> Question, are you opening your Bible? 201. Brian just talked about our classes. 101, 201 through. 201, Pastor Jeff taught, teaches you how to have a quiet time. And when you open your Bible, say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, open my eyes. He will hear that prayer. And he'll show you the invisible. He's no respecter of persons. This isn't just for Elisha. This isn't just for that servant 3,000 years ago. This is for us. This is for you. This is for me. And then, Lord, and the, fourth, the fifth bullet, when Christ opens my eyes to a proper understanding of Scripture, my heart will be set ablaze with joy, with hope, with testimony, and a desire to minister to other people. What are you talking about? The day of Jesus' resurrection, two disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus, and they were all depressed, out of sorts, because Jesus had been crucified. And they didn't know he'd risen yet. And Jesus all of a sudden appears and comes up alongside the road with them. The disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now listen. And he listened to them. He said, what's going on? And they said, where have you been? Did you not know that the one that we thought was the Messiah has been murdered and crucified? And Jesus listened and then he started talking. And they were fascinated by what he was saying. And then he ate a meal with him right before it got dark. And Luke records, then their eyes were opened. He was in his glorified body. Evidently, they didn't recognize him for that reason. Or God had just shaded their eyes for a moment. And it says, then their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight and they said to one another, well, listen, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? Listen, and while he opened the scriptures to us. 
When you open this book and say, Lord, open my eyes. Y'all, it makes my heart burn all the time. It's burning right now. It's burning that you see this. It's burning that God opens your eyes to this. It's burning that it'll motivate and, and, and move you forward in your spiritual growth. I expected God to open eyes today. I expected God to bring people here. And I said, Lord, I want to be your Elisha today. I want you to open their eyes. He made my heart burn over this. Where'd that come from? I didn't come up with that. It's because He opened the Scriptures to me. And He'll do it for you. And you know what? It's the key to prayer. It's the key to hope. It's the key to joy. It's the key to ministry. It's the key to spiritual growth. When Jesus opens the Scriptures to you. You can't. And guess, by the way, they got so excited, they took off running back to Jerusalem and started telling everybody what had happened. Where'd that come from? Where'd they get that boldness? Where'd they get that joy? Where'd they get the desire to minister? It's because Jesus had opened the Scriptures to them. That's vision. That's spiritual vision. Are you not excited about your Christian life? Be honest. Are you excited about your Christian life? If you're not, it's because you need the, the Lord through His Spirit to open the Scriptures to you. I hope you'll go home and read 2 Kings 6 today. And say, Lord, open my eyes. I don't want to live a boring, humdrum Christian life. You want more from me than this. Open my eyes. Make my heart burn for the things that make your heart burn. Let me tell you something. God talks to me all the time. And I'm not some fruitcake idiot. And neither are you. God talks to me through this book. But when I read it, I ask you to open my heart and mind to it. And guess what? He talks to me. And you know what? He'll talk to you. And he'll show you the invisible. I see it all the time. And he'll do the same for you. Who are you and Elisha for? And I'm done here with this last one. Who are you and Elisha for? Who are you praying for that God would open their eyes? Elisha prayed and, the Lord, and, he, and he said, Lord, I pray open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. Yeah. But I'm not a prophet, Denny, and I'm not Elisha. We'll look at 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. I'm in Elisha right now for several people. Some of them are your children. Some of them are my children. I got a long prayer list. I'm asking for God to open their eyes. Who are you and Elisha for? Who are you and Elisha for? Who's God put into your life that He wants you to pray for? You say, well, Pastor Denny, they just don't care about spiritual things. And people just don't seem to care about spiritual things anymore. Don't say that. John 4, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, for they are already white into harvest. Let me tell you something. God's at work all the time. He's at work in the lost person's life all the time. And he says, don't say that people don't care anymore. Don't say that they don't are interested in spiritual things anymore. The problem is, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers... There's not enough laborers with the spiritual sight to say, you know what? I need to start praying and I need to start moving for God in this area. There's 40,000 unchurched people in this county. 
There's some things going on behind the scenes that I'm going to tell you about here in the near future. Don't say that the fields aren't white and the harvest. They are white. We're going to harvest them. But we've got to become Elisha's first. I want to invite you to pray with us tonight at 6 o'clock. Come and pray. But more than that, I want to invite you right now to bow with me and say, Lord, open my eyes. That I may behold wonderful things for you. Let's pray. Lord, have your will the way here today. Open eyes. If there's someone here and you're opening their eyes for the very first time and I'm speaking to you, just say, Lord, forgive me and save me. Have mercy on me. I realize today you've opened my eyes and I realize I'm a sinner and I need a Savior and you have the power to save me. Forgive me and save me right now. Christian, what is God opening your eyes to? What do you need or what do you need him to open your eyes to? Ask him. This prayer bench is open here. You need to come, come and pray. And several come in the first service. God is stirring your heart. Cry out to him. Lord, Move us now to honor you, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let's all stand. You need to come. Come on. Oh, to Jesus. Do what only you can do and open our eyes.